Our next speaker is Tish Brewer. Uh, Tish Brewer received her master's degree in book and paper conservation from the Kilgarren Center at the University of Texas at Austin. She has had additional conservation training through various AIC courses and through, inter through internships and professional experience. She has been a paper conservator in private practice in Dallas since 2007. Tish, Tish I'm sorry, serves as the Lone Star Chapter Chair for the Guild of Book Workers and has also been a regular contributor to the GBW newsletter. She sometimes teaches workshops on various book arts related topics as well as how to make terrariums. And her talk today is entitled, Extensive Conservation Treatment of a Very Oversized Advertising Poster. Howdy. I'm here to talk to you about this beauty. Um, it's a 1910s advertising lithograph poster, obviously for Cracker Jack. It came to me from a small museum in Montana which was established, I think, in 1985 and is spread over about five acres in several buildings. Collections there vary. Military, old-time Americana, they have a lot of vehicles. It's very patriotic. I don't know very much about this poster at all because they don't know much about the history of this poster at all. They've never been able to track down another. How it came to be there might make you chuckle. The head of this little museum found the poster through a friend of his brother who saw two of these in a frame shop in Idaho. One was being cut down into pieces apparently for the use of the linen, so he bought the other intact and then kept it for some time just rolled up somewhere. The head of the museum kept asking after it and eventually coaxed the owner out of it through a barter deal. He traded a slew of items, including an all-terrain vehicle, a farm ATV, for this poster. <laughs> so it finally traveled to Montana to become part of the collection. Thereafter, for many years, it was kept in one of the museum's buildings on the property, which I gather to be somewhat like a non-climate-controlled barn or tractor building. The museum was initially only interested in stabilizing that top right corner. After almost a year of back and forth discussion about the condition and the possibility of museum staff repairing this themselves, I finally convinced them to ship it to me, rather than me traveling to do the work on site and I realized it needed much more extensive conservation treatment than previously thought. The size is seven by nine feet, and it was daunting. The poster was mounted to linen, and the linen wasn't in good condition. There was mildew throughout, thankfully on the linen only. Several areas had been wet, so there was staining, failure of the adhesive, especially in areas of moisture contact. The paper was about as thin as newsprint, was covered with surface grime and dust, and was pretty brittle. Both the poster and linen were nailed to wooden rods at the top and bottom, but had broken away from nearly all the nail holes. The bottom rod was slightly warped. It had been rolled up and glued to the bottom edge of the poster for further support, but that adhesion to the paper had failed, causing the rod to skin the poster with large losses to the media. There was a lot of distortion overall, mostly from being stored rolled. The top right corner was fractured into numerous pieces with lots of loss, as you can see, and the edges were pretty shot as well. Once I saw the piece in person, I decided it would really be best to treat the entire poster rather than just reattach those broken pieces back onto the bad linen and call it done, which is what they were asking me to do. This meant that the presumed course of treatment went from being relatively minor to being something really major. I suggested the rods be removed and saved for possible reuse, that the entire poster be thoroughly surface cleaned, the linen removed, the poster washed, remounted to Japanese paper, possibly mounted to a secondary support, and in addition, there was to be many hours of infilling the losses and in painting. That was sort of my quick response before I thought too many hours about the logistics of size. My initial thoughts about what needed to be done as well as the proposed budget were a huge shock to this tiny museum. But I was in love with the object, my mistake. Um, so I lowballed the estimate essentially at the max of what they could afford, and told myself it would be a labor of love, at least half pro bono. <clears throat> As I was preparing for this talk, I began to think this was gonna come across really straightforward, and it, it wasn't that for me at all. There were so, so many logistical issues I had to think about. The largest piece I'd ever treated up to this point was a billboard, but it was in six parts, each about four by six feet. That was beginning to look like a piece of cake compared to this one giant thing. 
My studio is about 1,300 square feet and kind of a weird configuration. And there are only two of us. I have three really large tables, but the poster was so big I wondered how much we'd need to utilize the floor as space and how we'd handle it overall with just two sets of arms and how I'd even find materials large enough to support the piece. All the while, I was troubled by the end desire of the museum in regard to installation, which was to hang the poster from rods as it was originally hung with no protection or framing. This just seemed terrifying to me. It's sort of flapping in the breeze like that, but there were no resources to do anything further, and I had to be able to ship this back after treatment rolled, not mounted to anything rigid because that would have been far more expensive. I spent many hours reading treatment reports, searching literature, looking for blog posts, anything that would give me more guidance on how to handle something this large, but every time I came across a reference to an oversized piece, it wasn't nearly this oversized. I began to lose sleep. Attempting to minimize my sense of being overwhelmed, though, I jumped in since the obvious first step was surface cleaning. I removed the top and bottom rods completely, wiped them with a dry cloth, and set them aside. I collected all the detached pieces of paper in a small tray to make sure none were lost and later surface cleaned them separately. I moved two of my tables together and began using the tube in which the poster was shipped as a tool to surface clean, first with a small vacuum attachment on low suction and then further using sponges and brushes. I would vacuum the reverse of the piece around the tube as it was unrolled so that I was getting the bulk of the dust off the front of the poster and the reverse of the linen at the same time, then repeated the procedure. Once that was finished, I was at a standstill. I hadn't completely decided how to remove the linen and wash the poster, the size being the issue. My assistant and I talked about building some sort of huge temporary tray out of wood and plastic and making a frame with PVC support material to lift this up and down, in and out of water as a whole. I looked at examples in textile conservation, but I couldn't find a solution that didn't require more people, more resources, more space, more money. So I kept thinking. The poster was actually printed in six pieces, so there were some, act there were some natural overlaps from where the, the pieces were originally joined together before being mounted. There was one vertical seam and two horizontal seams. So after much deliberation, I decided to split the poster along its horizontal seams where one piece overlapped the other by at least a couple of inches, presenting me with a little forgiveness because I didn't actually have to cut the poster only to split the pieces. This would give us three large sections, the top and bottom portions being about two and a half by seven feet and the center being approximately five by seven. I felt like this would still be challenging, but it would be manageable for us to wash and line each part of, of the piece on top of the tables, based on our previous treatment of the billboard. Once I got the poster split along the overlapping areas, I would cut through the linen to fully separate the parts. There was another pause to fully discuss and plan our exact procedure for removing the linen, washing and drying the pieces, and then later lining them. We measured over and over, researched the size of materials we could acquire, and made sure we had gone through the logistics of how to do this within our space on three tables, which are thankfully all eight feet long. Each section was placed over support fabric, the smaller pieces on top of holly text and the larger section on top of a piece of polyester fabric I found at the fabric store. We treated each part one at a time due to space concerns. So we covered a four by eight table with plastic and then with layers of tech wipe. Each poster piece was humidified overall in a pack on the table face down and then gradually wet until saturated. After a few minutes, I could begin mechanically removing the linen from the reverse in one piece. Next was removal of the old adhesive as best as possible. I did this by continually spraying water in the reverse and using a large brush, brush to clear away adhesive, which was then picked up from the edges of the support fabric using sponge cloths and a slurry of dirty water. I repeated this procedure a few times to both remove adhesive and to wash each part. I cleared away as much of the old adhesive as possible, but wasn't too concerned with, being, with some being left behind. And the wet paper couldn't take a tremendous amount of this mechanical action anyway. Another large piece of holytex was placed over the poster and it was moved to the adjacent table so that the tech wipe could be changed and then capillary washing continued. The poster was moved off the washing table again and an entire roll of paper towels was gently rolled over the surface to remove excess water. The edges of the holytex pieces were weighted to minimize distortion during brief air drying while the adjacent table was fully cleared of tech wipe and sheet plastic. The poster piece was flipped face up and excess moisture was removed through the holytex as much as possible. 
The piece was again weighted on the edges and left to air dry while more cleanup happened before finally flipping it face down to dry in this manner completely so it would be in the proper orientation for lining. So as you can see, there was lots of back and forth with the piece currently being washed. It was a juggling act. The remaining pieces of the poster sat in waiting on the third large table, and we also set up a, a temporary fourth table to move the smaller section to once, once dry. I continued with the second smaller part and finally the largest middle part of the poster until all had been cleared of the linen, washed, and air dried. The middle piece was treated the same as the other two, but it was more challenging because it was five by seven and I'm barely taller than five feet. But I had a small movable platform to stand on and just worked my way around, removing the linen until I had collected it in the middle, then raised myself up higher on a stool to reach the center. This large portion was supported by a different polyester than the others, which proved to be an issue when wet because it got too stretchy and it was difficult to manipulate. After washing, we ended up partially drying this section over plastic egg crate, which is what's happening here, in an effort to dry it quicker because the moisture was uneven and the fabric was sticking to it where there was more water. Because of this hiccup, I decided the support material for the rest of wet treatment, apart from Holitech, should be mylar. So we found the widest roll we could, which was 60 inches, barely enough to accommodate the largest section in future stages of treatment. Once, once this stage was over, the poster was ready for lining, but I really wasn't. So I went through a period of avoiding the Cracker Jack, which we now affectionately called the monster. I thought for weeks about the lining. At this point in the treatment, planned a secondary lining as well. I was really perplexed about the secondary lining, but got the courage to proceed with the primary lining. The poster was originally mounted onto the linen with wheat starch, so I knew it, that my primary lining, whether there was a secondary one or not, was going to be wet, a wet lining using wheat starch paste and methyl cellulose. It's what I was 100% comfortable with, and I knew I could easily reverse it if something went haywire. For the lining paper, I chose rolls of Sakishu Extra Thick based on available papers and heavy enough weights and in the size I wanted, and then another unforeseen setback occurred. My rolls of paper were held up for weeks due to a port strike leaving me even more time to think about the lining. I decided that each smaller horizontal section would have only one piece of lining paper running horizontally, and the larger center section would have two large sheets running horizontally, so there, the, there would be the least number of seams overall. So that meant we only had one seam. We made a large batch of paste every day before lining. The poster was prepared on one table, fully wet face down on top of Holitex. The lining was prepped on another table on top of Mylar, and paste it out with wheat starch and methyl cellulose. Once the lining paper was ready, we picked it up on the mylar, flipped it over, and slowly laid it down on the reverse of the poster, first allowing contact in the center and then out towards each edge. We had made these sort of registration marks on the table and on the mylar using blue tape to assist us in alignment. There was an excess lining of at least a couple of inches around all edges. As there were only two of us, I have zero pictures of this process for you. <laughs> and now wish we'd asked a third person to be there just for documentation. This step was something we rehearsed several times to make sure we'd be as in sync as possible. Once the lining was down, I encouraged contact and smoothed it out using a large stiff brush, working to remove air bubbles moving from the center out. I probably did this for about a half hour. We then flipped the piece face up, I removed the holly tucks, added more moisture as needed, aligned all the tears, adjusted the creases, inlaid all of those loose pieces, and then replaced the holly tucks. The piece was then flipped face down, the mylar was removed and replaced with holly tucks, and the poster was sandwiched between two layers of holly tucks. More moisture was removed. I did this for quite a long time. It was an arm workout for sure. I didn't want the piece to be too wet when it went to the next stage of drying, which was between felts. The poster stayed between felts until nearly dry, and then the felts were removed, replaced with full sheets of blotter, and the poster was sandwiched between large pieces of heavy plexi and placed below boards and weights. This was to encourage as much flattening as possible, though I didn't expect perfect flatness for such a large piece of paper. It was left there for about two weeks. We repeated the entire procedure with the second smaller poster piece, which unfortunately left the most difficult one for last, the largest. For that section, it required twice the space, so the other parts being fully dry were on our temporary fourth table, which meant that the large section of the poster could be prepped on the two four by eight tables shoved together, leaving the other five by eight table for prepping. 
This section had to be lined in halves, with each lining sheet the same size as used for the smaller pieces and slightly o overlapping horizontally through the center of the large section. So everything about this was more difficult, especially positioning those two giant sections of the lining. But since this was our third and fourth go at handling that size, luckily it went off without a hitch. The drying process was the same, just with all available materials perhaps dispersed differently. Physically, this section of the poster was more taxing to line as I had to reach the center of a much larger area. Once the piece was fully dry, I noticed it was not as flat as the others due to size. But I also felt that excess lining on the edges and that overlap might be introducing some distortion. I had planned to cut the left and right edges of the lining off anyway, and for the center poster piece, I didn't need the top and bottom either, because that would be in the way when rejoining the three sections together. So I cut away all the excess lining material and left it underweight for several more weeks. I cut the lining from the side edges of the two smaller poster pet sections, but left excess at what would be the top and bottom most uh, of the full poster for use in rehanging. I joined the top part to the center along the original overlap, using thick wheat starch paste as low moisture as possible so I wouldn't introduce any distortion. Obviously, now there's a layer of lining paper in between the pieces, which is one of the reasons I chose not to use an even heavier lining paper. I wanted it to be as inconspicuous as possible. So that join was dried beneath blotter boards and weights for about a week, <laughs> every little bitty weight I had. Uh, at this point, I should note that we had anticipated it becoming more difficult to maneuver the poster as a whole again with just two of us and needed to introduce something to assist us in a dual manner, both in manipulating and moving the poster throughout the remainder of the treatment and to aid in return shipping. We found a local manufacturer of industrial cardboard tubes and had them make one each in two different widths, but approximately the same length. One tube was planned to fit inside the other for return shipping. These were rigid and sturdy, plus they were brand new, which meant they were clean. We began using the more narrow of the two tubes as a tool during treatment because we didn't have enough truly flat space to work on the poster fully open at seven by nine feet. And also having a section rolled would allow me easier access to the center. I utilized the tube to roll the poster at the top, creating space for me to join the final piece to the bottom. Once all were reunited, there came a time now and again that I'd require most of my table space for other projects. So I'd fully roll up the poster and clamp the tube to the table to keep it still. I also felt this would maybe give the poster some time to adjust to being whole again. Then it was time for fills along all the edges and especially in that top right corner that was so previously fractured. I used the same Japanese tissue for those as I did for the lining, adhered with wheat starch, dried fully beneath weight. I filled all the losses no matter the size, so I even filled the nail holes because I wanted the edges to have as much strength as possible. Thankfully, there were no fills in the center of this thing that I had to reach but this stage took ages. So back to that secondary lining idea. I felt for many months that I needed to do a secondary lining overall in order to ensure the safety of the Cracker Jack once it was installed without as much protection as I would have liked and without a rigid support. After numerous discussions and a lot of thought, I honed in on perhaps using Beva film to mount it overall to a secondary lining of maca paper. I decided against another wet lining because it was back in one piece at this point and I couldn't fathom how that could possibly be done. I considered making my own double-sided heat set, but due to perceived ease, I went with Beva film. So I did large tests using pieces of my lining paper and maca paper adhered together with Beva film after doing tests just to find the right activation temperature for those materials. I don't typically use Beva for anything except small areas and I rarely use it with paper. So the poor results I got at first led me to believe it was user error. I spent more time getting advice and some further instruction for Beva film and applications where really large artifacts were being mounted to rigid supports, and I did more tests. I hated all of the results, and I want to stress hated. Um, I didn't feel comfortable doing this to the poster overall at all. I foresaw disaster. Soon after, I decided to abandon the full secondary lining idea altogether and felt that no matter what recommendations I gave, if something was going to happen on the other end, there was only so much I could control anyway. Once I decided this, I felt a huge sense of relief and was encouraged to finish the project. However, I still wanted to further strengthen the poster where it needed it most. I ended up making edge lining several inches wide using Lasco and my lining tissue, and I adhered those all the way around the reverse edges of the poster. 
These were especially important at the top and bottom where the excess lining would potentially be wrapped around new material to be hung or might be folded multiple times if nailed through for attachment to new rods. The edge lining really added a lot of strength. We tested moving it around and even hanging it by the top, so I was confident it would be okay. The final step in one of the most time consuming was in painting. I added a couple layers of methyl cellulose to all my fills and then used watercolors to end paint. The challenge here was that I couldn't just end paint with one red and one yellow and one blue color as it looks like I might be able to because this was printed in six parts. Each piece had lots of variations in those colors, sometimes to a really significant degree. So I mixed several shades of each. In some areas, I layered on top of the watercolor with colored pencils to better match the layering effect seen in the lithographs. And here's the result in the area that probably gives the most dramatic before and after, and the one that was of all the concern in the first place. One thing I should note here is how difficult we found it to take pictures of this as a whole. At this point, it was back on the floor of the studio at, for after treatment photos, and my assistant was on a ladder to capture the photos. So matching the light and other aspects of such a big piece while 10 feet up in the air was really challenging. It was just so expansive. I also want to mention packing for shipment here as well. The poster was rolled around one of those rigid tubes we had manufactured about nine inches wide, then covered with holly tax, then thin pylon, then thicker pylon, as much as it needed for it to be snug, but not too snug when placing it into the outer tube. All of that was covered with a layer of plastic, temporary for shipping, and with the added bonus that it made it a little easier to slide the poster in and out of that outer tube. The original wooden rods were secured to the inside of the inside tube, with no risk to the poster should they loosen a bit in transport. We cut wooden rounds to match the openings exactly and screwed them to the sides of the tube to close it off for end caps, then covered those end caps entirely with packing tape. I told the monster goodbye, somewhat sadly, uh, shipped it back to Montana for final with final instructions for unpacking and recommendations for installation, of which there were many. Once it arrived at the other end, I continued to consult with the museum on options for hanging using the resources they have and haven't heard anything since. So to give you an idea of scale, here's me and here's the poster. <laughs> Treatment took about 16 months total, which is the longest period of time I've ever had an object. And that entire time we were also logistically juggling numerous other projects. I was also going through periods of avoidance. Um, the experience taught me a lot and I certainly learned my size limit would I do something this large again? Probably, now that I know I can, but next time I'd charge for it in full. <laughs>